here tonight, preferably, and if you're not able to, then listen to it online, and I hope it'll be a help to you. Lord laid this on my heart this morning from 2 Kings chapter 2. Let's stand as we read the text. I want to preach to you on what are you looking for? What are you looking for? 2 Kings chapter number 2, verse number 1, And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the, and the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither, so they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee, before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had smitten the water, when he had also smitten the waters, they were parted hither and thither. And Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Brother Kelly, would you ask God to bless the preaching, please? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to preach to you on what are you looking for. Here in this passage of Scripture, God records for us the commencement of Elisha's ministry. The old man Elijah is kind of about to go off the scene and God is done with Elijah. But just because God's done with the old man does not mean God's done doing a work. And God here gives us a recording of the beginning of Elisha's ministry. Elisha is starting out in a very bad time in Israel. This is not a good time to be called to preach. You remember the storyline that Elijah had gone through a lot. He'd been depressed. He'd been discouraged. He'd been frustrated. And and God had said to Elijah that he was going to go and he was going to anoint Elisha to take his place. That was about 10 years ago. And now for 10 years, Elisha has been following Elijah around, ministering to him. And the Bible says pouring water on his hands and and taking care of him and just staying in the background, watching the old man and serving God wherever God called the old man to go, the kid went with him. And Elisha is now ready to take over it in, in Israel as the prophet of God, preaching to God's people and trying to do a work for God. Listen, it's not a good day and a good time for a man to be a prophet of God in Israel. A lot of bad things are going on. Reminds me a lot of the United States of America and where we're at today. A lot of bad things are going on. 
Bury your head in the sand all you want. Try to claim everything's okay. Everything's not okay for America. Everything's not okay for the world. You see, the thing for me is I don't judge whether or not we're in the end times based on our nation. I don't believe it's fair for us to judge how bad off things are just based on how we feel about our own country, about our own finances, our own morality, our own economics, our own spirituality. The Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Wickedness was spread throughout all the nations in that day. And let me tell you, friend, you and I live in a day that is very wicked all the way around the world. There is fewer and fewer Christians and more and more pain. Paganism. I'm not talking about the in-between complacent people. I'm talking about the two polar opposites, Christianity, Bible-believing, following Jesus Christ, the old-fashioned gospel, fewer and fewer genuine Christians, and more and more paganism going on around the world. Driving through, I think it was Madison Heights, which is just on the north side of Hazel Park, right? Driving through Madison Heights to get to Hazel Park uh, last, uh, last Thursday. I passed a pagan temple. You don't see very many of them. I sent them all over England and Scotland when we were there. You don't see very many of them around here. A pagan temple. I, I'll, get, I'll get back to you after, after the service. You don't know what it means? It's, what it is is a place where they go, just because you may not be the only one. That's okay. No, no problem at all. It's a place where you go and you actually practice the occult. It's witchcraft. So they literally believe that they're tuning in to the devil. They literally, put, we saw it in, in England, and you think it's a joke. I, hey, it's all right, I'll stop and park it here for a second so we understand. We think it's a joke. I saw with my own two eyes, as of what was it, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, with my own two eyes, the witch's tent set up. People sitting out in front of that tent and her mixing up potions and handing them st- this stuff, and they're drinking it. What it was was drugs. It's, it's really just that simple. And I watched him. I watched a kid, and I I told you this before. I'm sorry to repeat it again. I believe I watched a kid have a bad trip that I don't think he'll ever be right in the head again. I've seen people trip before. That kid was bad off. And there's more and more of that coming. And the Bible prophesied that stuff is going to come in the end times. There's going to be a rise in sorcery, a rise in demonic activity, a rise in witchcraft, a rise in drugs, a rise in alcoholism, a rise in marrying and giving in marriage. And that's exactly the day and age you and I live in, where they're trying to say anything is a marriage. Well, that's not a Bible definition. Folks, we live in a very bad time for somebody to be a Christian. We've had some people even, I believe, and I, don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't name them because I haven't completely 100% nailed it down, but I'm fairly convinced we've had some people leave our church because they're afraid of my talk against homosexuality and against ungodliness, and they're afraid of the pressure that's building up. It's like, well, I better distance myself from him because we may wind up in trouble preaching like that. Listen, let it come. Let whatever's going to happen happen. It doesn't change the truth of the Word of God. Let me go on record saying I don't hate homosexuals not even a little bit and sin is sin whether it be drunkenness homosexuality swearing lying hypocrisy self-righteousness no matter what your sin is sin is sin but when a nation begins to accept and embrace homosexuality as mainstream the Bible shows that nation is already so far gone in all other areas that the judgment of God is coming on that nation. Now you can like that or lump it, but that's the fact of the matter. And that's where we're at today. So let me ask you a question. What are you looking for in this world? What are you looking for in life? What do you want? Money? Anybody anybody tested the winds of the economy lately? All this positive and happy talk about, oh, we're rebounding. You know how slow we're rebounding? And the debt crisis was not fixed. I'm not a financial counselor and I'm not a financial genius. I'm not a stock market guru, obviously. (laughs) But I don't have a whole lot of hope. And a lot of very educated people on the subject don't have a whole lot of hope for the future, future of our country economically. Was that what you got your, your hope in? I'm sorry, but your hopes might be firmly dashed. 
I watched over the last few years as all these people who had lived all their life worried about their retirement, worried about their nest egg, worried about the future, are all panicking as they're, well, everything I've worked, I've talked to adults, I've talked to individuals in their 50s and 60s saying, everything I'd worked for, I've lost so much, i got to keep working now. Listen, what are you looking for out of life? I'm not saying it's, not, it's wrong to have money. I hope you do. I'm not saying it's wrong to save for retirement. You ought to. But I am saying you ought not have your faith in that stuff. That ought not be what you're looking for out of life. What are you looking for in life? You ought to have a good marriage. Amen? Amen. Christians ought to set a precedence for a good, godly marriage. But can I tell you something? That ought not be what you're looking for in life. You ought not be looking for a good marriage. I know a lot of people are looking to raise good kids. I hope to God I can. (laughs) Who knows what will happen? I'm trying, but that ought not be what I'm looking for in life. What are you looking for? I want you to look here and see what Elisha was looking for. You see, Elisha wound up being a great man of God with a great history written about him. He made a difference in his generation. I don't know about you, but I plan on making a difference in mine. And if I don't make a difference, by the grace of God, it ain't going to be for lack of trying. I want to make a difference. Elisha strived to make a difference. But let me show you, first of all, he knew what he was looking for. You see, in verse number 14, he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Elisha knew what he was looking for in this life. I'm afraid to say it, but I'll bet you that most people in this room aren't even sure what they're looking for out of life. Not even positive. You say, we're here on Sunday morning, preacher. I'm a born-again Christian preacher, you probably still aren't sure what you're looking for. What are you looking for? You see, when he's asked the question in verse number 9, it came to pass as they were gone over, Elijah said unto Elisha, ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, you know what Elisha knew in the top of his head what he was looking for. Immediately when Elijah asked the question, Elisha says, I know what I want. I want a double portion of thy spirit. He didn't have to think about it. He didn't have to pray over it. He didn't have to prioritize. Well, I want a new house. I want more money. I want a raise. I want my marriage fixed. I want my problems taken care of. I want victory over my sin. I want, I want, I want. He didn't have to think about it for a second. He said, hey, preacher, I want a double portion of what God's done in you. I want a double portion of that thing. Give me the God of Elijah. He knew exactly what he was looking for out of life. What are you looking for? All those things we tend to chase tend to dissipate before our eyes. Have you ever noticed that? The more harder you try to build a good marriage, the more it seems to frustrate you, doesn't it? Quit caring about your marriage and see how frustrated you are with it. If you don't care, it don't matter, right? The more you care, the more you try to fix things, the worse they get. Have you noticed? The more you try to get your hands into your life and straighten your life up and accomplish what you want, the more it seems to escape from you. You ought to prioritize what you're looking for. The Bible says, Blessed are they that keep His testimonies and that seek Him with the whole heart. We ought to be seeking God with our life. You ought to be seeking God with your heart. You ought to be striving and longing and desperately looking for God to show up. When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Have you sought the Lord's testimonies lately? You opened up your Bible and said, God, what do you think about this? God, what do you think about me? God, what do you think about my thought life? God, what do you think about my heart? God, what do you think about my motives? What do you think about what I'm working on? God, what do you think about me? Seek his testimonies. When you said to seek you, Lord, I said, Lord, thy face will I seek. When's the last time you just sought the face of God? Well, I'm not called to preach. If you're born again, it is your duty to seek the face of God. And if you're not born again, you better start looking for a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I ain't talking about religion. I'm talking about a relationship. This isn't just stuff that applies to a preacher. Boy, I mean, God help me, it ought to apply. If I'm not seeking God, how can I help you? How can I push you? I know there's been a lot of preaching lately on your personal devotional life. 
but I'll move on when the Lord moves me on. If you've been here any length of time, you see how that happens. And if the Lord ain't moved me on yet, then I ain't moving on. I want God to do something in your heart. I, I, I worry about attendance, of course. I wouldn't be human if I didn't. But you know what the Lord always reminds me of? It's not so important about how, how much the attendance is. What's important is how deep they're growing individually. Are you seeking God with your heart? Or are you just here this morning because it's time to go to church? What are you looking for in life? A couple of things that will be a nice little test here to show you Elisha wasn't looking for. So most of these things I'm going to point out to you are things we do look for. And if these things ring a bell with you, it means you're looking for the wrong thing. First of all, he wasn't looking to please people. Look at verse number 3. The sons of the prophet that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from your head today? Notice the sons of the prophets. That, caught, that stuck out to me. Here Elisha was literally from his background an absolute nobody. He's out there plowing in a field when Elijah comes by and says, God told me to anoint you. You're up. He's a nobody plowing a field. He doesn't have the background that, you know, is necessary to be a mover and shaker in Israel. He doesn't have the background that is necessary to reach people in Israel. Furthermore, he doesn't really have the personality that fits to take Elijah's place. Elijah was rough. Elijah was tough. Elijah was mean. Elijah was prone to fits of temper. He was prone to major emotional swings. One second he's over there cutting off 400 heads of the prophets of Baal. The next minute he's running from a woman because she said, I'm going to do to you what you did to them. And he's running and hiding and ready to quit on God and completely give up because he's exaggerating. I'm the only one left. There's nobody but me. I'm going to quit. God comes and feeds him. He runs in the strength of the meat. God gives him 40 days. God feeds him and works a miracle. He has strength from something. God supernaturally feeds him for 40 days. You'd think after something like that, man, you'd be like, you know what, Lord? I'm sorry for being a baby. Not Elijah. God had to really get on him. And it was at that point God said, all right, you're going to anoint this guy to replace this king. You're going to anoint that guy to replace that king. And you're going to anoint Elisha to replace you. All right, Lord, I'll show you in a minute. He actually looks like he anoints Elijah, Elisha with a bad spirit about it. In other words, from the beginning, the old man seemed, seemed to have, from my perspective, it's just what I think I see in the scripture, he seemed to have maybe a little bit of animosity toward the younger preacher, which is very common in the Bible. That's what the Pharisees had towards Jesus Christ, run the references. A lot of that happens. It's human nature. Elijah was one kind of a guy, man. You could see Israel following him. Elisha comes along, polar opposite. Much softer in his speech, bald-headed. Elijah was hairy. He is a man's man, a roughneck boy. He'd get the job done. Elisha comes on the scene totally different, a mama's boy. Because when Elijah came by and anointed him, he said, let me go home and say goodbye to my family. And Elijah says, what's that to me? Okay, go back to mama, kid, whatever. I didn't anoint you. Elisha didn't seem to be too worried about what everybody was thinking of him because here the sons of the prophets are probably looking at him saying, how come he got to be with Elijah? Who does he think he is? Why, what does Elijah see in him? It wasn't what Elijah saw in him. It was what God saw in him. You know what God saw in him? A heart that sought after God. Elisha was looking for the right things. And therefore, God disregards his background. God disregards who his daddy was. God disregards his personality. God disregards all the things about him that don't seem to match and don't seem to fit from the flesh. God looks over all that stuff because God sees a heart of a young man who is seeking after God. He's not worried about what people think. You know what his answer is to the sons of the prophet? Here he is alone. You don't see Elijah sticking up for him at all. Sure would be nice if the old man stepped up and said, Hey, leave the kid alone. He's got God on him and you're jealous, you bunch of punks. Run home to mom with your cream puff in your mouth, you little baby. Get out of here, leave him alone. Wouldn't that, be, now, wouldn't that be a blessing to the young guy? Man, the old man stood up for me. I mean, my reputation precedes me. He's passing off his mantle onto me. What a blessing. Nope, not Elijah. He ignores the situation. And Elisha, he looks at the sons of the prophets and he essentially says, I already know, shut up. You know why? 
Elisha knew what he was looking for. So when people criticized him, it didn't get to him. He said, yes, I know he's going to be taken away from me this day. Hold ye your peace. Don't you get annoyed when somebody tells you something you already know like you're stupid? That'll bug you. Like, you know, kids start getting a little bit older and they think they have a brain. Have you noticed that? And it's like they start falling, oh, you dad, you need to, dad, be careful with that. Dad, he's like, what? That, I mean, I, I, try to, I, I try to say, I mean, I literally, I, I think it was yesterday I said, thank you, honey. I, I know, but thank you. I appreciate you looking out for me. But my knee-jerk reaction is, who do you think you are educating me on how to do this work that I'm doing when you couldn't even name the tool? It's obnoxious, isn't it? Hey, Elisha, you know he's going to be taken away from you today? Uh, duh, I've been traveling with him for 10 years. I poured water on his nasty, dirty, stinking hands. His feet stink like crazy. I know how much he belches. I mean, that's how much I'm around the stinking guy. And you guys are telling me where he's going. I'm aware of where he's going. You see, even though they're criticizing him and picking him apart, he doesn't get distracted by any of that. He says, yes, I know where he's going today. Hold your peace. Leave me alone. I'm following the old man. He was not concerned with public opinion. And I tell you, if you're going to be worried about public opinion, you will not find Jesus Christ if you're lost. Because nowadays, Jesus Christ is not popular. Can't even pray in his name. I'm not going to chase this down because it's a waste of my time, especially with you sitting here this morning. But it is obnoxious to me. It is more than obnoxious. That nowadays, we've got to cater to Islam. We've got to cater to our enemies. And we have to cower, or they expect us to cower, when it comes to the name of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. They can kiss my stinky feet. Amen. 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 That's irritating. If you worry about public opinion, you will not follow Jesus Christ. If you worry about public opinion, you will not seek the face of God. Verse number 5, the same story repeats itself as he's heading to Jericho. They come, knowest thou, the, the, knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? He answered, yeah, I know. Hold you your peace. I know, fellas. Shut up. That's what he's saying. Hold your peace. Shut your mouth. They, they think he's stupid. He wasn't trying to please the people. He wasn't trying to please the preacher. Look at verse 2. Elijah said to Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, <laughs> As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. Elisha wasn't worried about pleasing the preacher, because it wasn't the preacher he was seeking, it was God. How about that? You know, he probably would have passed, failed a test right there. I don't know if Elijah knew what he was doing or not. Usually the old man generally does know what he's doing, a little more than people think, maybe a little less than he thinks, but a little more than people think. He might have known what he was doing. He might have been testing him out. Either way, God was, because God said, your job is to go follow Elijah. That's all God told him. So far, he hadn't been anointed for, to take over. He was just there to follow Elijah and help him out. So there he is following Elijah around. The old man says, God sent me there. He said, I'm going with you. He said, stay here, please. I'm going with you. Can you imagine how cranky Elijah would have been to follow around? A guy who will take a sword and cut off 400 heads. A guy like Elijah who will argue with God? He says, stay. And the kid said, I ain't staying. I'm coming with you. He wasn't worried about whether or not the preacher was cranky. He just followed him. Why? Because he was seeking God. And God said, follow the preacher. That's all there is to it. I'm not telling you, you got to follow me. I'm telling you, God gave Elisha orders, and Elisha was obeying God's orders. Look at verse 6. Elijah said to him again, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. He said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. He was following, he was seeking God. He wasn't seeking the preacher. Can I tell you, when it comes to a church, you ought to be seeking God in that church. Not the preacher, not the style of preaching, none of that stuff, not the programs. It ought to be God's presence you and I are seeking here on a Sunday morning. We start this thing up in Hazel Park. We ought to be seeking God's presence, God to show up. I've been asking him to show up. 
I've been asking him to make himself real. You know why we're doing it? Direct obedience. Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. It's just what he said to do. He opened up a door. Opportunity came. Things fell into place. I didn't push nothing open. And if he closes it, so be it. He did it all the way through the book of Acts. He closed doors and opened doors. That's fine. It's just a matter of obedience. You know what I want? I want God to show up. If God will show up, we'll be all right. Verse number 6, the preacher does it to him again. He follows the preacher again. He wasn't seeking personal promotion either. Look at verse 9. It came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask thee what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Elisha said, Let a double portion of thy spirit. You see, Elisha wasn't seeking his own good. He said, Let what God was doing in you be done in me. Give me what you got. You know, somebody seeking their own promotion would be saying, make my name great. Let me be the man. Let the whole world recognize what God's doing in me. Not him. He wasn't seeking his own promotion. He was simply looking to follow God. You see, the insecurity of his question in verse 14 shows he's not arrogant. His question in verse 14, where is the Lord God of Elijah, showed a heart that was truly and genuinely and humbly seeking God Almighty. He was saying, where are you, Lord? He was not 100% sure that he actually got what he was asking for. He was not, you know, I followed Elijah around for 10 years, and I was faithful to serve Elijah for 10 years. You know, I know that God's here. No, he was still seeking God. Even though he was anointed to take over that position, he did not get cold. He did not get complacent. He did not get arrogant. And ten years later, his desire for God had not worn out. He was excited for the next step. I've been looking forward to our ten-year anniversary as a church. It's coming up quick. I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to do something big for it. Ten years. I'll be 40 years old and it will be our 10-year anniversary as a church. That's exciting to me, man. You know why? I want to see God through the second decade multiply his power like he did in the first one. And can I tell you, God has been doing a work here. It's been almost eight years or nine, eight, where are we at? It'll be nine in January, right, or eight. 2008, we started. Whatever, you do the math. Eight years in January. Folks, you know what God's been doing? He's been laying a foundation for eight years. I saw it when I was over there in, in the UK and came back. God's been doing a work. Our church is stronger than I expected, and praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that. And it doesn't mean we get complacent. It means after ten years of following God and doing the little things and being small, We say, God, would you please double the portion of your spirit you've given to us in the next 10 years. Oh, I want to see God do something. I don't care about what people are asking for out of church. You understand that? I don't care about what the other preachers are going to say about church. I don't care about whether or not my name is attached to the work. And oh, look at what Brother Reagan, I'm not worried about my name because I know one thing for sure. If I seek to please people, if that's what I'm looking for, that's going to give me ulcers and probably a nervous breakdown before long. Listen, if what I'm doing is trying to please the preachers, that's going to make me nothing like what God wants me to be. It'll make me a hodgepodge of everybody else and I'll turn into a chameleon and as I get around each preacher, not be a man following God, doing the work God would have me to do, where God would have me to do it, how God would have me to do it. No, what I want is God to show up and to know that I've got God in a way I've never had him before. I don't want it to wear out with time, but i got to know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for God. Elisha had burned his bridges. Look at verse number 8. They too went over on dry ground. Now, hold on a second. The old man was the one with the power to part the red, to part Jordan. Elisha didn't know yet whether or not he even had the power. So in other words, when he said, I'm going with you, he did not have a backup plan. He said, God sent me with you, I'm going with you. There was no escape route he was working in the background. There was no, well, if things don't work out, you know, here's what we'll do, and I'll be okay, and, you know, I'm going to make sure that where, I'm, I paid attention to where we crossed, and it was real shallow just up a little ways. He had no backup plan. 
When God said, Elisha, follow Elijah, he said, God, I'm in it. I'm going with you. I'm getting across that river. If the old man can part it, I'm going with you. And God, if I get over there and I don't have you, oh well. But I would rather take my chances than miss out on an opportunity to get a hold of God in my life. You know what the problem with most people is today? I mean this. Saved and lost alike. Apply it to the lost first. Lost people won't come to God because they don't want to burn their bridges. Well, I like my drinking. I like my doping. I like my fornicating. I don't want to live that kind of a holy life. They won't come to God because they don't want their bridges burned. Well, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I've had people say that to me so much. I just don't want to be a hypocrite. Under conviction, God's bothering them. They don't know 100% for sure that if they dropped dead today, they'd go to heaven. Something inside of them is just real uneasy about that. I'm pretty sure. I think I'm okay. But not genuinely convinced that they know according to what the Bible says. According to what the Bible says that they're going to heaven. You know what the problem is? They won't burn their bridges. If that's you this morning, it is time for you to start seeking God and say, God, if you show me what it means to be saved and make yourself real to me this morning, I will turn to you and I won't go back. I don't care what's back there. I don't need it. That's why I'm looking for you this morning. What the Christian's problem is? Like we preached Wednesday night, God wants you on the altar. Don't come up here and, I surrendered to preach. Well, good for you. A lot of guys surrender to preach and find out later they were never called to preach. And the ones who are real men that have character actually admit it and just bow out. Those are real men. Amen. The ones who don't, you know, I made a public profession. I told everybody I'm called to preach. I can't back out now and go on to destroy something and make a big mess in the name of Jesus. Blaming it on God the whole time. I'm not asking anybody to surrender to the mission field. I'm not asking anybody to surrender to preach. You know what I would like to ask everybody in this church to do? I'd like to ask everybody to surrender themselves to God. Amen. 100%. Well, how will I know? If you surrender yourself to God, you'll know. It'll come in time. It'll work itself out. You're not going to give up your life and move across the seas. If you're not fully surrendered, burn that bridge. He wouldn't burn the bridge. He, he burned the bridge. You know what you and I won't do? Christians won't do. They won't burn that bridge. Too in love with the world. Too worried about what God might ask of them. He was on the Lord's side. He said, I'm going over and I'm not turning back. He wasn't worried about a way of escape. Aren't you glad Jesus Christ didn't have a way of escape? Amen. He said, hey, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. If it be possible, if there's any other way, God said, there ain't any other way. He said, all right, then I'm going. And he charged right into a line of fire he knew was going to get him. And he laid down his life for me and you. Sure worked out all right in the end, didn't it? Aren't you glad he did? Then why is it too much for him to ask us to lay down our life for him? But we won't do it, will we? Elisha found what he was looking for because he was willing to burn his bridges to get it. Elisha wouldn't give up. I want you to notice that. He wouldn't give up. You know what he kept doing? Every time he was asked to turn back by the old man, hey, stay here, I'm moving on. Stay here, I'm moving on. He said, no, I'm going with you. Sons of the prophets came out. Don't you know what's going to happen today? Hey, stupid, don't you know what's going to happen today? Be quiet. Didn't let anybody stop him. Let me show you the illustration. Keep your finger here in 2 Kings and go to Matthew chapter 26, please. Matthew chapter number 26. He kept going. If you're looking for the Lord this morning, you can't stop. There's never a time to give up. You never arrive in seeking God. One thing that has just excited me so much, and I, I don't know, you know, it, it, it sounds arrogant to say I believe I'm growing spiritually. Doesn't that kind of sound arrogant? But you also should ask the Lord and, and assess yourself and see where you're at. Isn't that fair? The Bible says, let a man examine himself. Right? So we ought to be examining ourselves. And I tell you one thing I've learned this year that stirs me up the most about spiritual growth is that the more I feel like I learn about the Lord, the more exciting it is. Because the more I feel like there is to learn. Every time I get an answer to one question, it's exciting because it opens up a bunch of other ones that are... It's amazing when God gives you the answers. It's amazing when you feel like 
God's working. The nice thing is what I'm trying to say is there's never time to say, no, I'll just stay here. I'm good. I've made it where I want to be spiritually. I've achieved. I'm not talking about building a church or a business or however you want to apply it in your life. I'm not talking about all the all the stuff you and I see and think about physically. I'm talking about in your personal walk with Jesus Christ. Nobody else knows about your personal spiritual development. There's never a point where you go, this is I have made it where I want to be and I'm going to stay here forever. This is good. If I can just maintain till I die. There's no such thing in the Christian life. You're either backsliding or you're going a little further. Your illustration is Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 26, 39. Uh, let's, look at, let's look at verse 38 to get the context. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, Not as I will, but as thou wilt. Verse 42, he went away again the second time. Verse 44, and he left them and went away again. Verse 46, he comes back to him. He says, rise, let us be what? Going. Aren't you glad Jesus Christ went a little further? Aren't you glad Jesus Christ didn't say, all right, I'm just going to stay here. If you guys don't want to go on and you can't handle it and you're willing to you just go to sleep, I'll just sit here, oh well. You think he'd have had the strength he needed to go through what he went through if he hadn't went a little further and prayed? If he hadn't ignored what the other guys were doing and just did what he was supposed to do? Folks, you and I need to go a little further. Back in first, Second Kings chapter 2, he refused to quit when other people were trying to tell him to stop. He wouldn't stop. You'll notice something else. Go, keep your finger here in 2 Kings 2 still. Let's go back to 1 Kings 19. He refused to quit when he was offended. 1 Kings chapter 19. Look at verse number 20. You know what the Apostle Paul told the church? Talking to him about offenses. He said, who's offended and I burn not? You know what the Apostle Paul was saying? He's saying, you guys get offended. And guess what? I get offended too. Can I tell you something? Doubtless, but that offenses will come. You know what stops Christians from seeking the face of God? Offenses. You offended me. Okay, well, it's all about you. So, I get it. Question, is it all about you? Is that what this is all about? Is this whole church here And always been here because of you. Is it all about your preacher? The preacher offended me. It's real hard for you to keep going to church and grow spiritually if you're offended at the preacher. It's just really, realistically, it's not going to happen. Well, let me ask you a question. Is this church here for me? Is it all about Pastor Mike? If it's not all about you and it's not all about me, then who is it all about? You're the church. This is your church. Who's it all about? I hear you whispering it. Jesus, the Lord. That's exactly right. So you know what we got to do when we get offended? Get our eyes back on Jesus Christ. Because you're going to get offended. But if you realize it ain't about you, and if I realize it ain't about me, and we can get our eyes on Jesus, we'll go a little further as a church. Look at 1 Kings chapter 20. Now I lost the other verse. 19. 1 Kings 19 verse 20. Watch this. Uh, 19, 19, sorry. So he departed thence and found Elisha. This is when I already quoted, I already told you earlier, God told Elijah to go find Elisha and anoint him. Here's him doing it. The son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. My word, man. He's in the plow with the oxen, <laughs> and he's plowing. That's, that's his background. <laughs> And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. So Elijah walks by him, throws his mantle on him, and walks away. Now what kind of a... I mean, if you said, Preacher, I'd like to talk to you about joining the church. And I took my coat off and threw it in your face and walked away from you, got in my car and left. Would you be a little offended? Uh, Modern day vernacular, I'm not going to throw my coat at you. Preacher, I'd like to join the church. That's great, thanks. Get in the car and leave. Wouldn't that affect, like, uh, that's going to be my pastor? I don't think so. Right? Come on, let's be honest, right? 
That's very offensive. What's he do? He runs after him. Like, I'm going to run you down. Oh, no, did I offend you? Oh, oh, are you okay? I ain't doing that junk. He did it. He's like, wait a minute, preacher. Wait a minute, preacher. He runs the preacher down. Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. Not the right thing to say to a guy like Elijah. I mean, really, that's like the drill instructor walking up to you, screaming in your face, and going, okay, but can I go change my socks because they just got wet, and then I'll come out and I'll get right in on whatever we're doing here to prepare for battle. He'd be up in your face screaming at you, calling you everything in the book, and he ought to be. Well, I mean, maybe not everything in the book, but he ought to be screaming at you, right? That's what, that's what the kid says to him. What's he say to the kid? He said unto him, go back again, for what have I done to thee? Good night, man. Take it easy. He just wants to say goodbye to his parents. He's, look at the character of this kid. He's willing to walk away from all of it to follow what God had the man of God tell him. He's going to give everything up. You can't stop for a second and go, no problem, dude. I'll hang out for a second. I'll eat a sandwich. You know, there's some locusts and wild honey all over this field. I'm good for a little bit. I mean, chomp on some grasshoppers. You go tell mom and dad goodbye. I'll be right here. I'm thinking I'll toughen him up later. He's just getting started. Not Elijah. What have I done to you? I don't care what you do. Catch me if you can, man. I got to follow God. That's offensive. But Elisha knew what he was looking for. He wasn't looking for a professional preacher. He wasn't looking for somebody that was going to pamper him. He was looking for God. He felt like he needed to go home and say goodbye. He went home and said goodbye. Pretty normal thing to do. He went and he caught up with the man of God and proved himself. He followed him for 10 years. But the whole point is, Elisha's motives were the man of, was seeking God, not the man of God. See, folks, if you and I are really going to find God, we've got to be willing to not give up, no matter how offended we get. The last thing I want you to see is Elisha stuck with the old paths. If you're going to find God, I'm just telling you, you've got to stick with the old paths. See, in verse 13, he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. You know what Elisha did not do? He did not say, well, he's gone now. I got a coat. And for 10 years, I've been faithful. For 10 years, I have put up with that jerk. Realistically, that was Elijah's personality. He was a jerk. You're not really a smooth guy when you personally cut off 400 heads and don't think too much of it, rejoicing in Jesus the whole time. That's a pretty rough guy. When somebody says, who was it that told you that? I don't know, a hairy man. And he was girt with a, with a leather girdle. Oh, that's Elijah. I mean, you could just tell the king a quick description of him, and he goes, oh, we know who that nut is. For ten years I've followed a jerk around. And I've humbled myself and I've stayed faithful and I've done my job and I've never hurt him and I've never gone against him and I've seen God do some great things and I've learned. Let me tell you something. You will learn some things in the field following the preacher around that you just don't ever learn in Bible school. I don't care how much money you spend on Bible education, what Bible school or institute you went to. You don't know it all until you spent 10 years in the trenches you probably learned a couple things you didn't know before. Don't you think Elisha had a pretty good reason to say, I'll take off the mantle God gave me, and I'll smite these waters, and I'll show them how it's done. Not Elisha. He had, he had some things figured out. And what he knew was, that old mantle, though I don't have to reinvent the wheel, the ones I got are working great. They got me here, they got me home, they got me around as long as I've been driving. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I've seen what that mantle can do. So no matter what the sons of the prophets are saying in their fancy school because their dads are well-to-do and they're all the big shots, no matter what their opinion is, I'm all by myself over here. And that mantle did the job. So I'm going to pick up the old man's mantle. They're all watching. 
I think it said 50 of them in the text, standing there watching him. He picks it up. He walks over to the water with the old man's mantle. And he looks up and he asks what's been in his heart the whole time. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? <laughs> Took the chance on looking stupid. You know what would have happened if he'd have hit that water and got, not gone anywhere? They'd have been laughing and la- they'd have loved it. People love watching you fail. When you step out to try something that they won't try, they love seeing it not work out. I guarantee you there'd be a bunch of people that would rejoice in their hearts and probably verbally if this church went under. (coughs) They'd love it. Guarantee you. People around town, you know, angry, angry nobodies who never wanted to get right with God, saying, oh, that's a cult, that's a cult. You don't even know, they can't even give you, what's the definition of a cult? They can't give you the definition of a cult. And they don't know what denominations actually fit under that definition. But, you know, they love it. But you know what you can't worry about? You cannot worry about what they're saying, who's looking on and who's watching. You got to know what works. Can I just tell you this morning, I do know what works. And I can say that with confidence, not arrogance, because I didn't invent it. If I'd have invented what works, then I'd be pretty arrogant. I'd have to struggle with that. I didn't invent it. Can I tell you something? The King James Bible, it works. The fruit of that book is obvious. We've been in Laodicea for at least 100 years, a slow, gradual decline in the church, and all those new Bibles have come out since then. So you show me one that had a worldwide impact like the King James Bible did that built churches and caused forest fires of the gospel throughout this country and the world like the King James Bible did. I'm just telling you, there's no point in reinventing the wheel. You're not going to find me wasting my time taking Greek and Hebrew so I can rewrite one that's more reliable when I've got one that works. And this church believes the King James Bible is the word of God and that is exactly what we'll preach because we know it works. So there ain't no sense in reinventing the wheel. Let me tell you something else. Local church, it works. God intends for us to have a place to gather together and to assemble. Every Sunday you ought to be here. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Local church works. It helps a marriage. It will help your walk with Jesus Christ. It will help your children. We're not inventing the wheel. We're not getting something new to try to work a miracle. We're not bringing the world into the church in order to try to grow the church. If we can't grow it, God. God's way, we just won't grow it. No need to have something new. I'll stick with the old paths. Thank you very much. Can I tell you something else about Bible Believers Church of South Lyon? When we started this church, we started it with our faith and our hope in the word of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And what we did from the beginning, and I mean I acted the fool. And I'm not even ashamed of it. I acted the fool. We're fools for Christ's sake, the Bible says. We preached like there was 100 people there with 12 people in a living room or 18 people in a storefront. We preached like 100 people were there. This church from the beginning was based on the preaching of the Word of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Old-fashioned preaching still works. No sense in reinventing the wheel. If you want to see God show up, grab the old mantle. Bible reading. Prayer, the old-fashioned gospel. Get on your knees and say, God, with nothing but this book and the name of Jesus Christ, please show up in my life. I need your face. Not, God, I have this problem, I have that problem, I have this need, I have that need. Don't you think he knows your needs? Don't you think he's watched you struggle? Maybe the reason he hasn't fixed your problems is because you haven't fixed your heart. And your heart ought to be no request but you. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning.